What's good, everybody? Welcome into the early ads. I, of course, am the coach, and this is our very first NFL prop spectacular for week number one of the NFL. First and foremost, I want to thank everybody who watched the live stream last night leading up to Cowboys and Bucks. We had a huge audience. Can't thank you enough. And as you know, we're going to have a live afternoon, early evening show every day of the week, except for Saturday. Coming up on Sunday, three shows. Morning show, noon to 1 Eastern, then 7 p.m. Eastern to 8.15 Eastern time. Now, this show right here, we're going to give you no less than 17 props to play on Sunday. So with that many, we got to get right to it. Let's bring in the stars of the show. And this is the very first time that I've ever done a show with these three at the same time. Boys, we're making history right next to Beautiful. Week. The fantasy guru. You know him from fantasy football today, Dave Richard. Welcome back to the early edge. Coach, it is great to talk with you. It's great to see everybody else. Let's win some money, baby. You know it, baby. And everybody's been seeing Dave's face all over our NFL futures episode. All eight are in your feed right now. You got two days before all those futures. They go off the board. They go off the board. Now, you want to know fantasy? You don't want to DFS? My man, see ya. What's up, man? Coach, it's Awesome to be here. I, I, I love being on the show with you because of your energy. So I, I just got to kick it up a notch. I got to match the energy. So let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's go. And I like that. Now, a man that I just let him be himself. I call him a resident rock star. And you talk about energy, it just it just, just exudes out of his veins. He is at Prop Stars on the Twitter. Alex, what's up, man? What's up, Coach? I couldn't be more excited to be on a show strictly talking about props. So I'm super <laughs> pumped. This is what you do. What did you say last night? How many props do you bet in the first five weeks of the season? The bulk of my volume comes within the first couple of weeks. So when all is said and done, it could be upwards of like 100 to 150. I've had as many as 200 in the first five or six weeks. So, yeah, this is where I uh, get down to business. The man That's called it. it the Super Bowl of his year, the first two weeks of the NFL season. That's how much this means to my man, Alex. All right, let's jump right in, guys. We got a lot to get to. And by the way, we got so many loyal viewers over there in the comment section, but there's still a lot of you that are not members of Sports Science. So we're going to do you a solid. Hit that like button. If we get to 100, I'm going to give away a year-long sub for free. All the analysts, all the cappers, all the simulations, but we got to get to 100. Should take us no time at all. Hit that like button. All right, guys, let's jump right in. We're going to start with the Eagles and the Falcons, 1 p.m. Eastern on Fox on Sunday. And these are two teams that both have new head coaches. Jalen Hurts will be the starting quarterback for the Eagles. Matty Ice is still down there in Atlanta, but not a lot of high expectations. We don't care about that. We care about props. Dave, I want to start with you. Call me Allen Iverson, coach, because we're going to talk about practice. <laughs> Last month, I went to a Falcons-Dolphins joint practice, and I never thought I'd get as much out of it as I did. But one of the things that I got out that you didn't see in the preseason was Mike Davis playing in the two-minute offense and Mike Davis running routes out of the backfield. He's going to be a factor in the passing game in Atlanta. And when you think about the offense, you think about Calvin Ridley running downfield, you know Cal Pitts is going to be a new toy in this offense. But those guys are going to pull the Philadelphia secondary back a little bit. And in certain checkdown situations, it's going to be perfect for Matt Ryan to hit Mike Davis. He averaged 6.3 yards per catch last year in Carolina. He could do better than that this year in Atlanta. Who else is going to be the passing downs back? for the Falcons. Is it really going to be Cordero? I don't think so. Is it going to be Wayne Gallman? I don't know. I think he's got frying pans for hands. So I think going <laughs> over 14 and a half receiving yards for Mike Davis, it, there's some juice on this. And I never like laying this much juice, but I'm going to do it here and I'm going to do it again on another bet. Minus 130 for Mike Davis. I think it's a safe bet that he gets at least 25 receiving yards and he helps fantasy managers this week as a number two running back as well. All right, Dave, I'm going to see just how much you watch the early edge right here, right now. Because you mentioned the juice. You mentioned the juice is at minus 130, something we don't really like to play when it comes to a prop. But I I no, sometimes the juice, Dave. Oh, you man. Got, you got me on this one. You got me on the – it's on the tip of my tongue, Coach. Anybody else want to help me? See you. Worth the squeeze. There it is. Worth the squeeze. I knew it. I knew it. I've seen the merch. I've seen the merch for it. I've seen the merch. Come on. Oh, man. That's okay. We're going to give you one. Alex and Sia came to your defense. I, It hurts my heart. Good teammates. I'm stuck. I feel like an idiot. 
Uh, let's stay in that same game, though. We went over with Mike Davis. But, Alex, you're on an under. What do you have? Yeah, Coach. So I have an under I like from this game. It's Russell Gage under 55 and a half receiving yards. Gage is a great story. He's a former sixth round pick. Um, he's carved out a role as a productive NFL receiver. That does not happen very often. However, this number just seems a very lofty for him. Um, at best, he's going to be third in targets. Dave mentioned Calvin Ridley, Kyle Pitts. Um, last season, uh, Gage played, played primarily out of the slot where he really benefited from having Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley on the outside command a lot of attention. Um, his role this season is a bit up in the air. Uh, Falcons coach Arthur Smith hinted at moving Gage outside a lot more this season, which could potentially, you know, uh, he could command some more attention. Um, I also think the Eagles secondary is actually going to be pretty underrated and surprise a lot of people. I don't think it's the plus matchup that it's been, you know, for the last few years. Uh, the Eagles added Steven Nelson in the offseason from Pittsburgh. He's a very solid corner, played on the Chiefs before that. Very underrated. Um, they also added safety Anthony Harris from the Vikings. PFF just had him graded as a top three safety less than two years ago. He's only 29 years old. Uh, the Eagles offense is, all, or excuse me, the Eagles defense has also been a, a mess the last few years. But one area they actually did well was defending opposing slot receivers. They actually allowed the third fewest yards to slot receivers last season. So, yeah, I'm fading Russell Gage this weekend. So much great information. Damn, Russell Gage. I'm going under, baby, 55 and a half. No questions asked. All right, let's switch gears now. Jets, Panthers, another uh, matchup of two teams that just haven't been very good. Uh, the Jets have been awful the last 10 seasons. Now, we got a rookie quarterback in New York and Zach Wilson. Then the Panthers also are kind of retooling things. However, Sia, they do have a guy that if he can stay healthy, he is an absolute stat beast. What do you like in this game? Yeah, I like Christian McCaffrey over the rushing yards. It's 71 and a half. Now, there's obviously a total yard, yardage prop there, too, which you can take. I liked the rushing yard prop better, and it's mostly because I think Carolina is going to be in a positive game script against the Jets. Let's keep in mind they're favored by five and a half, five, six, depending on where you look. So I like Christian McCaffrey in that positive game script to be running the ball, particularly in the second half. We know he can break off a run in the first quarter and cover this prop, but let's not forget that Lawson and Davis are out for the season here. So the Jets are not only hampered by being the Jets, but they're also hampered by actual injuries. And just, you have to respect the pass catchers, no matter what you think of Sam Darnold. You have to respect Terrace Marshall, Robbie Anderson, and DJ Moore. And so in this game, I don't think you're going to be able to crowd the box like you would normally be able to do on a team that doesn't have this depth at pass catcher one through three. I like this nugget, too, because I think Christian McCaffrey has a chance to really be historical. If he can stay healthy, we know that's been an issue for him. Uh, he could get to 400 touches now with that extra game. Uh, last player to do that, LT, 2006 the year he won the MVP. And I think McCaffrey really wants to show everybody how good he can be and stay healthy. So I like that play. All right, let's move on now to Chargers and the Washington football team, 1 p.m. Eastern on our network, CBS. And I know that Ryan Fitzpatrick is setting an NFL record for starting for his ninth NFL team. But here's the deal. He's never finished a season starting all the games since when? 2015. It's been six seasons. So mm -hmm. today, Talk to me about this game, though. Just this game. I, I think you're going to see Ryan Fitzpatrick have the starting job all year long. He's going to have to be really miserable to lose it. Washington really doesn't have anybody else that they can be that confident in. A lot of the guys were on the team last year, and then they added Fitzpatrick. But one of the things I also expect Washington to do is run more and throw less than they did last year. 37.4 pass attempts per game last year for the Washington football team. And it just so happens that the pass attempt prop for Ryan Fitzpatrick on Sunday is 37.5. Now I'm not saying because that they threw the ball without Fitzpatrick there last year is going to be the reason why this goes under. I'm saying they're going to be able to have a lead in this game at home against the Chargers, and Antonio Gibson's going to get himself some numbers, and I think you're going to see Ryan Fitzpatrick not quite hit that mark. Over 30 passes, sure. 35 passes, yeah, maybe he gets close to that. But without Curtis Samuel there, that's a big difference. Curtis Samuel is a short area target. Those little pop passes, those shovel passes, those screen passes that you see quarterbacks do, they look like throws that you and I could make. Even Sia could make those throws. But I know Ouch. for a fact that those are attempts that matter. If Sir Samuel were playing, I'd be nervous about this prop. Curtis Samuel's on IR. I think we're going to see Fitzpatrick throw a little bit less than normal, and I think we can cash in this one under 37 and a half pass attempts for Fitz Magic against the Bolts. 
the only thing I like more than me jabbing somebody is when somebody else jabs somebody on the show. So, Dave, thank you for that. Thank you for that very, very much. I'm, I'm going to get it back from see you later. I know it. There Offense no, taken. <laughs> there is no doubt. Uh, now, Vikings and the Bengals. This just screams. Everybody wants to watch, right? Uh, one Eastern. Uh, the Vikings do have the longest tenured head coach in uh, Mr. Zimmer. However, uh, they've done nothing in the playoffs. The Bengals, Joe Burrow says, hey, listen, I've worked on a lot of stuff in the offseason. I can't wait to show it off. Well, we haven't seen you in the NFL, but for a couple of weeks, we can't wait to see you show it off either. So, Alex, what prop in this game do you like? Yeah, I like Tyler Boyd over four and a half catches. Um I love Tyler Boyd this season, both in fantasy and both, you know, for props. Boyd had at least five catches in eight of ten games last season. Then he played with Joe Burrow. Uh, Boyd and Burrow displayed great chemistry with Boyd averaging 6.9 catches per game um, with Burrow behind center. The Vikings defense gave up the fifth most targets to opposing slot receivers in 2020. Uh, the Vikings front seven to me looks very stout and formidable on paper, while the Bengals offensive line Looks like it's going to be outmatched and unable to run. And the Bengals look like they're going to be able unable to run the ball effectively against Minnesota. I think that'll force the Bengals and Joe B to have to throw a ton. Um, the Bengals still do not possess a quality pass-catching tight end on the roster, which further bolsters Boyd's role as Burrow's primary underneath option. Uh, also factoring Burrow's return from an ACL, in, ACL injury, I think he may even be more inclined to get rid of the ball quickly. And due to the depth of Boyd's targets compared to T. Higgins and Jamar Chase, he should really be the benis- big, biggest beneficiary of that. I think that's the most important part is that, uh, first of all, I think the Vikings defense is going to come after Burrow quite a bit, and he's going to need to get rid of that ball quickly. And Boyd is going to be the target that's going to be closest to the line of scrimmage, and Burrow is going to be able to hit him. This prop made my list. I didn't include it in my top five, but it's up there. I love it. Great call. I tell my friends back home, I grew up in Kansas, and I have a lot of friends who – shoot a 72 on a local course, think they could play on the PGA Tour. They also think they win a couple of prop bets that they're professionals now. And I tell them all the time, watch my guys and listen to what Alex just said right there. And that separates those that think they can do it and the professionals. So let's leave it up to professionals like like my, my man prop stars. Now, let's stay in that same game because on the other side of the football, see ya, you're seeing a couple of numbers that really stuck out to you. What do you like, pal? Yeah, first of all, I love that Boyd prop as well. Uh, I, I like Kirk Cousins over 258 and a half passing yards. So a, a couple things here. One, Trey Waynes is out for Cincinnati. They lost William Jackson in free agency to the Washington football team. They did pick up Hilton, but it's basically Awuzie Hilton and Eli Apple to cover this receiving core, namely Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. It's just a really, really poor matchup. And before we, we say, oh, well, it's just Kirk Cousins, like one thing to consider here in 2020, Eighth in passing yards, seventh in air yards. And so that's probably a little bit higher than you think. Now, take that stat and measure it against a Cincinnati defense that is that is going to have to match up with Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, and, of course, Dalvin Cook, who will also be catching passes. I I think this is a really interesting game. By the way, I I like Boyd in DFS, too, as a pivot off T. Higgins, who's going to be really chalky. And I like the Vikings to cover the spread here, too. But give me Kirk Cousins. I think he's going to air it out. Okay. Uh, did you also have like a, a future prop or, or the highest scoring team prop that you liked here too? This was interesting to me. Yeah. So there's there's a couple that I like in and, and it's uh, uh, Vikings are one of them, a plus 1400. I think it's just a good number. I mean, that, that's going to be like sixth or seventh on the list. If this game goes back and forth, which I, I expect it to a little bit, I think Cincinnati will be able to put up some numbers here. I think Kirk Cousins, I think this is really going to be a coming out party. And if we just go down narrative street a little bit here, Kirk Cousins is one of those guys that he's had a really bad offseason from a PR standpoint. And that chip on his shoulder, like he's had it ever since being drafted at Washington when he when he joined forces with RG3 and Kyle Shanahan. So I really think this is a moment where Kirk Cousins wants to rem- wants to remind everybody who he is and he can do it against Cincinnati. And let me be clear, that's just for week one. So Vikings plus 1,400 or Arizona plus 1,800 just Mm -hmm. to have the highest scoring week, correct? Correct. And and keep in mind when it comes to those, I'm really betting the number more than anything. I really see value in both of these numbers. I only qualify it like that because I do expect Arizona to probably lose to Tennessee. But at plus 1,800, I like the number too much to stay away from it, especially since it's a tight spread. All right, very good. And understand, when we talk about value and we talk about betting certain things at plus 1,800, we're expecting to lose. And those people that are new to sports betting don't understand that concept. 
But eventually, over time, if you trust the numbers, these will hit and you will come out profitable. Now, here on this show, every single week like we do, uh, every other show, we want to be interactive. We want to answer as many questions uh, as we can and put our guys on the spot because they're the pros. We've got two or three people in our comment section, and anybody can jump in, just raise your hand. A Calvin Ridley over five and a half catches prop. Does anybody want to comment on that from my man Eric Brown? Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I mean, it seems it almost seems a little too good to be true. I can't imagine Ridley not even seeing 10 targets in the game and knowing what his catch rate is. Getting six-plus receptions should be pretty easy. I do know that the Philadelphia secondary, we've already talked about it, it is going to be a little bit better than it's been in the past, but I still think Ridley can manufacture at least six catches. So this seems a little suspicious to me, but I'm still going to take it. Just wouldn't put a ton on it. A little bit. Just, you know, a couple of, uh, I don't know. Peanut I shells. I see. I want to go a little bit more than a sprinkle. Oh, okay. It's better than a sprinkle, but I don't want to dump the whole, you know, bag of sand on it. If you catch my drift. Okay, great. Uh, Alex, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love this bet as well. This actually almost made my list. Um, I think you know Ridley's going to be just an absolute target monster in that offense without Julio Jones. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but without Julio Jones, I believe he cleared this um, in six of seven games last season, but yeah, I, I think he's just going to see double digit targets and he's definitely going to have at least six catches. All right, very good. Another question from one of our viewers, Adam Orsini, Marquez Callaway under 50 and a half receiving yards. Anybody want to take that one? Not everybody at once. Not everybody. At well, once. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, the, the reality is I think we need to temper our expectations with respect to Callaway a little bit. And we, we all saw him on prime time in the preseason and we think he's somebody that he might not be. But I got to be honest with that number. It's just a stay away for me because it's just at the right spot for me not to have confidence in the under or the over. I hate to cop out with that, but if it was 60 and a half or, you know, 58 and a half, I might have a different answer. But that's right about where it should be, in my opinion. I feel like the odds makers, whenever they're not sure about a guy, they just their their default is fifty point five. Right. And so I right. think they're not. I'm certainly not sure about Callaway in his first game where he's the number one receiver. I love him in season long. I would use him as a number three receiver in fantasy this week with the upside of him breaking through for a couple of big plays. I know Winston's going to look for him. Whether it happens where he gets over fifty one yards, I don't know if I'm comfortable telling people to put their money on that just yet. See, it's fascinating what you just said, Dave, because now I want to come back over here to Alex, because Alex, you have a theory that the there is a reason why you are so heavy as far as amount of props that you play in the first two weeks is because of what? Yeah, I just think the books are, you know, kind of behind the eight ball. There's just such a huge surface area to cover for them. There's just so many props. Dave mentioned that they kind of just default to certain numbers. You know, it's just impossible to really accurately handicap just the vastness of the prop space. So, yeah, I agree. And also just to kind of touch on Callaway, and I agree with Sia and Dave that I just need to see it first, you know, having very limited, um, you know, data, plus not having seen Callaway play a lot with Winston in the first in his first game. I just want to see it before I kind of offer a strong opinion or lean one way or the other. See ya. Yeah, one thing to consider if you think that number is a little lower than you thought, it's probably because Jair Alexander will be shadowing not the, the full game, but a lot with uh, Marquez Callaway. So that's something to consider. He's obviously one of the premier corners in the league. Right, very good. And be, and be uh, uh, I want to be very, very clear to all of our incredible uh, viewers, listeners, whatever, uh, that send in the questions. My guys, when we give out plays on our shows, these are the best plays that they have found across the board. So when you ask about a certain number, we're going to give you an answer, but that doesn't mean that they're going to go and play it because they spend hours and hours and hours getting ready for these shows to give you the six or seven plays each that we give out. So just be careful because I don't want you tweeting at us in three days going, but you said no, <laughs> just gave the information. We do. Okay, let's move on now. Steelers and Bills, one of the marquee games of the entire week, and it's one Eastern CBS. Now, remember, the Steelers started last year 11-0 and 0, and then absolutely crash and burn down the stretch. Big Ben, he came out the other day. He said, hey, TJ Watt, whatever he wants. Well, apparently whatever he wants is $112 million, $80 million guaranteed. So the defense looks to be solidified. But this is about the offense. Dave, talk to me. 
Man, I wish Roethlisberger were my agent when my contract is up. Uh, right. That would be sweet, right? I'd be making a lot of prop bets then. Uh, I like Juju over four and a half receptions. I think about the Bills' defense and how they play. It's a predominant zone defense where they funnel everything toward the middle of the field. They're not going to give up the big play. So that's number one. And, and we've seen slot receivers in the past against Buffalo as recently as last year put up six-plus catches against them on a pretty routinely basis. I could give you the names. Jamison Crowder was one of them. Cup, Jacoby Myers. How about Juju Smith-Schuster? He did it last year. He had six catches against Buffalo. But the same thing that we talked about with Tyler Boyd and Joe Burrow and that connection is in play here as well. I know the Steelers' offensive line looked good in the preseason. It came against the second-string Lions defense and uh, against the second-string, not quite all second-stringers in Carolina, but a mix of first- and second-stringers. The Buffalo Bills' defensive line is much improved, and I think it's going to be dangerous. I think it's going to be part of the reason that they're in the serious Super Bowl hunt. I think that they're going to get to Roethlisberger. He's going to need to get rid of that ball quick. Smith-Schuster runs a lot of routes close to the line of scrimmage. I think you're going to see Juju Smith-Schuster easily get five-plus receptions. There's a lot of juice here, but as I tell all my friends, the juice is worth the squeeze. <laughs> Fair enough. Touche. Touche. Okay, okay. Maybe I borrowed that from you, Coach. One time I borrowed it. <laughs> okay. It felt good. It felt, it felt like you uh, had redemption. Uh, quickly, uh, before we get to your other play there, hit that like button. We're getting very, very close to 100 likes. When we do, I will stop the show immediately, and we will give out a year-long sub to Sportsline. Now, Dave, you have another, unless I missed it while I was listening to my producer, you have another prop from the same guy, same game, right? Uh, I don't think I do, but I, I know oh, that yeah. Sia does. My I bad. Sia does, and I fully support it. <laughs> well, my bad, Dave. Dick. Dave, that's not too much of a surprise because it's basically an alternative way to play Juju Smith-Schuster, and it's the over uh, yardage prop, 53 and a half yards. And I won't rehash everything Dave said. I, I agree with all of it. He's going to stay on the field. If you're wondering between Chase Claypool, Deontay Johnson, and Juju Smith-Schuster, in three wide receiver sets, of course, Chase Claypool will be on the field, but in two wide receiver sets, he's probably out of there. So let's remember that not only will Juju be on the field more often than, let's say, uh, Chase Claypool, for example, but he had 128 targets last year, 20% of the target share, and he will be running those short area routes. Um, I, I really like this one. I don't think he's going to be, I don't think he's going to be seeing much of Tr Tredavious White. And so I think this is a really good number for him. What's the juice on that one, Sia? It's actually minus 115. So there you go. Like if you want to play Juju, you if you liked my prop, but you don't want to lay 140, go with Sia's prop and lay 115. There you go. I like it. By the way, I need to bring this up because when we did the NFL Future episode with R.J. White, uh, he gave out in the NFC South episode, he gave out Antonio Brown 200 to 1 to lead the league in receiving yards. Last night at halftime, do we all remember what Antonio Brown had last night? <laughs> A buck 18 in the first half. Oh, R.J. was feeling himself on Twitter too. And I'm going to feel like an idiot if I didn't at least sprinkle a little bit on that prop at 200 to one. He may, I mean, obviously it's 17 games, but he looked pretty good in game one. He looked pretty good in game one. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, all right. Speaking of looking good last year, Aaron Rodgers looked fantastic. Third MVP, but it was a off season of turmoil. Is he coming back? Is he going somewhere else? He decided to come back. They changed that contract to basically a one-year contract, and then he can go wherever he wants apparently next year in 2022. Now, the one frustrating thing about Aaron Rodgers is that when he gets a big lead, there is nobody, with the exception of maybe Tom Brady, that controls the game better, runs the play clock down more, and finds his running backs more than he does. So that can translate into our next prop. Alex, what do you got? Yeah, it's tough to fade one of the goats, Coach, but I've got Aaron Rodgers under 39 and a half passing attempts. Um, this is at minus 115. Uh, I just think 39 and a half is way too high of a number. He was held under this in 15 of 18 games last year, including the playoffs. He averaged only 32 pass attempts uh, per game in the regular season in 2020. Um, opponent quarterbacks that faced the Saints last year were held under this total in 13 of 16 regular season games. Um, the Packers are perennially, perenni perennially one of the slowest paced uh, team, uh, teams in the NFL. They average, I think, the third fewest possessions per game last year. Um, the Packers also did not make really any notable changes or upgrades to the receiver group outside of adding 
Randall Cobb, who I don't really think moves the needle at this stitch, uh, stage of his career. Um, I'm just expecting the Packers to once again play a ball control style offense, kind of similar to what you talked about, Coach, and lean on their running game. They've got two great running backs, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, especially in the regular season. Also, I know the, the point spread is only three and a half points, but with this game being in Jacksonville, it might end up being a home game for Green Bay with the way the Packer fans travel. Um, I just don't see the the Saints really keeping up with the Packers in this game. I don't expect Green Bay to be playing from behind very much, nor do I expect Rodgers to have to throw it 40-plus times a game. So, yeah, I love this prop. How dare you insult the fighting Jameis Winstons and those Saints in week one coming out strong. By the way, uh, it was a surprise to a lot of people uh, that Jones decided to come back. Four years, $48 million. Sixth highest paid running back in the league now to go with that second round draft pick in A.J. Dillon. So good play there by you. Now, our next game is going to be the 49ers and the Lions. So we have a question in the chat from Timmy Blackwell. So let's start with that one first. Then we'll get to the plays that we're giving out. George Kittle, over 55 and a half receiving yards against the Lions. Anybody would like to take this? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so I, I do love George Kittle. Um, he's obviously a tremendous tight end, tremendous talent, highly productive when he's on the field. Um, the issue I have is just I don't see this game being very competitive. Obviously, the point spread reflects that as well. And I can just see a scenario, and I'm going to talk about it when I get to my prop, where 49ers are up big, possibly double digits, and just not needing to throw the ball a lot and just relying on their run game. So I, I'm not necessarily going under on this prop, but – if I, I would just probably stay away personally from it, and yeah, I'm 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 good with a sprinkle on the over on this one, Coach. I, I think that when you look at George Kittle and what his upside is, you just go back to the end of last year when he started to put up some decent yardage, and there were other games earlier in the year where he was in the triple digits. It doesn't have to take that much for him. Maybe only four catches for him to get over 60 yards or so. That's what we're looking for here. Jamie Collins of the Lions is a linebacker who might cover him. I don't think he can hang with him. Will Harris is the safety. I don't think he can hang with him. I think there are some exploitable matchups that the 49ers can roll with here to get George Kittle going. I don't mind doing a sprinkle on, uh, on one George Kittle over 55 and a half yards. Oh, my gosh. It, it Completely, my heart is exploding when you talk like that to me. Uh, all right, Dave, I want to stay with you because I know you have two props in this game. Then we'll get back to Alex uh, for his. So what are the two that you like a lot? So the first one that I think is worth the price tag is Trey Sermon scoring a touchdown at plus 240. Now, Raheem Mostert's a guy that we like a lot in fantasy this week. Jamie Eisenberg on our Fantasy Football Today podcast named him his start of the week. But Trey Sermon's the rookie behind him, and he's in that secondary physical type of role, and he could be used in short yardage situations to begin with for the 49ers. There's also the fact that the game doesn't figure to be competitive, just as Alex said. So Sermon could get some extended work in the second half in the fourth quarter. That could lead to a breakaway run form where he can score a touchdown. So plus 240 is that, but you can also bet on him getting two touchdowns in the game, and that's plus 1600. So you can break out, you know, the little kitty shovel that you use in the sand when you go to the beach and take some of that and put it on the plus 240 <laughs> and then just take a little bit off, give him one of these, a little bit of the, you know, salt bay I love on the it. plus two <laughs> touchdowns for Trace love Sermon. It. He could open up his career with a couple of scores against this hapless Lions D. Did it shock anybody last night that Gronk, what we talked about on the show, didn't we, Alex? You get inside the 15-yard line, who does Brady look for? There's just certain guys that are just really good in the red zone. And I think Sermon's one of those guys. I think he's a guy uh, that is really going to be looked at a lot. Um, all right. Are you clear? Are you clear, Dave? Are you good? I got another one if you want one. That's what I thought. So Because, go, because listen, up. Coach, if, <laughs> if I could just, you know, compose myself for a second. <laughs> okay. There are players in the National Football League who just command attention from the general public. And I'm here to lay out a prop on one of those players. Give it His to name, me. of course, is Mohamed Sanu. 
Of course. I didn't even know he was on the 49ers until I was watching <laughs> preseason games. And there he was running around. You know, he's an older guy, so he wasn't running around real fast. I, I know he's not the number one receiver. That's Brandon Ayuk. I know he's not the number two receiver. That's Debo Samuel. And I'm not sure he's the number three receiver because Trent Sherfield, remember he caught that big bomb from Trey Lance in the preseason and everybody went crazy over Lance. No one paid any attention to Trey Sherfield but he might be the number three guy. He's a little bit more explosive than Mohamed Sanu. So there's an over-under on his yardage of 21 and a half, minus 120. I'm taking the under. I don't know if he's even going to play. He might be active. He might work on special teams. He might return some punts, but I don't think he's going to get 22 receiving yards. And there's also a prop on the longest reception that Mohamed Sanu gets. And I know the world wants Mohamed Sanu to be bold and outstanding and great. But he's not catching a ball for 15 yards. His over-under on the longest catch is 14 and a half yards, minus 115. And I even did research on it, Coach, because you want a complete story told yes, on do. Muhammad Sanu. And here it is. Over the last two seasons, he's caught 83 passes. Of those 83 passes, only 13, 13 measly passes have gone for 15-plus yards. So here's a guy that doesn't really get a lot of yardage when he catches the ball. I don't think he's going to catch the ball much, if at all. Mohamed Sanu is going to go under on both of these props. This is easy. This is easy money. Well, you know what's going to happen then. You know the first play of the game, they're going on a 15-yard no. no. fade. No. <laughs> nope. You. you know that's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Oh, it's going to happen. It's uh, not going to happen. They're not going to do that to me. Why would they do that to me? Oh, my God. <laughs> I will tweet right at you if that happens, although I don't want to lose. Yeah, I'm going to – yeah. I I'm probably going to turn off the TV for an hour if that happens. Uh, there is a question I want to get to because a lot of guys are talking in the comment section. I will get to that. It, it, it's uh, in reference to correlated parlays within the same game. So, see it, Dave. I want you to think about that for a second because it's a good way to educate people, including myself. But, Alex, I want to get to your other play here in the 49ers and Lions before we leave this game. What do you got? Yeah, so this is actually my favorite prop that I've come across all week. Um, I just absolutely love this play. It's Raheem Mostert. Under 17 and a half rushing attempts. It's very juicy, but in my opinion, it's well worth the squeeze. Um, Mostert did not eclipse this total in one game last year. He was 0 for 8. Um, he's only received 18 carries in one game in his five-year career. That is one game out of 48 games played he has had 18 carries in a single game um most has just never been a workhorse he's also shown major durability issues throughout his career it's hard for me to envision a range of outcomes where the 49ers coaching staff just decide to hand him essentially his career high in carries in week one against the hopeless lions um dave talked about trey sermon who's also obviously on the roster and he's going to be heavily involved in the game plan um, the 49ers are the biggest favorite on Sunday. I, we talked about this earlier, too. I could just see a scenario where uh, most are not needed in the fourth quarter. Uh, the Niners are nursing a double-digit lead, and the game's just likely to be out of hand, and they're looking or they're going with Sermon at that stage. So, yeah, this is my favorite prop of the week, Raheem Mostert under 17 and a half rushing attempts. Can you repeat that number for me for the people at home one more time? How many games and how many times over 18 carries, please? One time out of 48 career regular season games. This has gone That's under 47 of 48 times. Not a misprint. I texted Maestro this, and he <laughs> like asked me to double check with the book. This is incredible. This yeah. is incredible. I mean, wow. Unbelievable. This, this, oh, clearly, oh. this is the favorite prop of the week. This is unbelievable. One Look, I, in four. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I hate to burst everybody's bubble. Uh -oh. Alex is he's correct in his statement, but I must bring your attention okay. to the January 19th playoff game. Playoffs. Let's go 49ers and the Green Bay Packers where Raheem Mostert had 29 carries. It's a miracle. It was a miracle at the time that he lasted that long without crumpling into a heap and, and kind of like scooching his butt off the sideline. <laughs> so it's happened once in the regular season, but it's happened twice in his NFL career. I still really, really yeah, love that yeah. prop, Alex. <laughs> Turkey always got to be the other side. I like it. I like it. All right, real quick, because we always try. We talk about it all the time. Educate, entertain. Educate, entertain. Now, single game parlays when it comes to props that are correlated, because, uh, Dave, you and C were just talking about the, the receptions and the yards. Uh, Dave, I'll start with you. And see you can piggyback how you guys feel about uh, single game parlays with multiple props. 
I, 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 if, if you can pull it off and you really believe in it, I say go for it. I know that there's some people that really don't believe in it and they really think that you need to just kind of separate things a little bit, but I'm not one of those people. I'm, I'm a go with your gut kind of guy. I like you. So the reality is a, a lot of books will let you do that and a lot and most books won't. So in terms of like correlating, let's say whether it's props or an over with with uh, something against the spread, like a book just won't let you put those two together. But some will. Uh, I know certain sites recently have been a little bit more uh, relaxed about that. So if you can do it, then you, you, what you're really saying is I have to be less right, because if you get the one right, the likelihood that you're going to get the, the correlated one right is obviously going to be higher. So instead of betting two separate things in theory, you're, you're betting two things sort of in tandem. So if if they'll allow you to do it, you should do it. Yeah. Okay? yeah I mean, why do you think the books are letting you do it? They want to admit, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. They have an they, edge. Yeah, they, they definitely have an edge. But uh, if you listen to really smart people like you guys, then you can beat the book and get an early edge. See what I did there? All right, uh, one more game that we are tapping into, and this to me is one of the five most intriguing games of the entire weekend. On one side, you've got the Dolphins, who upgraded in a lot of positions in the offseason. They have two at quarterback, former Alabama quarterback. Then on the Patriots side, shockingly, Cam Newton was released. He said yesterday on his YouTube channel, hey, Cam, Mac Jones would have been uncomfortable with me backing him up and sitting on the bench and standing on the sideline every single week. So he understood why the Patriots had to let him go. However, Mac Jones is a starting rookie quarterback. A lot comes with that. See it. What do you see in this game? What prop do you like? You said it. You said a starting rookie quarterback. And what comes with that is under 230 and a half passing yards. I mean, it's just not a great matchup for Mac Jones. And I don't think it's going to be like gunslinger mentality with Josh McDaniels and Bill Belichick. I think it'll be conservative, both from a pace standpoint and a throwing attempt standpoint. I don't think he's going to throw the ball downfield too much, particularly since Nelson Aguilar looks like he's not going to play in that game. I think it's going to be a lot of Jacoby Myers, short area targets, a lot of John U. Smith, short area targets. So, yeah, he might have plenty of completions, but I don't think he hits the over 230 and a half receiving yards. Oh, by the way, the Dolphins feature in the secondary, two of the best guys in the secondary that any NFL team can buy, and that's Xavier Howard and Byron Jones. So that's something clearly working against uh, Mac Jones. God, Howard's a beast, isn't he? God, he is so, so good. And he's making a lot of money now, too. He is making a lot of money. All right, our final prop of the day before we do a recap. And uh, I'm going to make each three of you. Timmy had a good selection, uh, a good suggestion in our comments section to do our favorite. We know what Alex's is, but our favorite prop of all of these. So, Dave, see you. Think about that. And, Alex, bring us your last one, please. Yeah, so I agree with Sia regarding uh, Mac Jones. It's definitely a tough matchup for him. I also agree that the Dolphins just have – um, outstanding perimeter corners. Um, we just mentioned them, but yeah, my favorite or my favorite prop from this game is Jacoby Myers over three and a half catches. I think he's the one guy that can benefit. Um, he averaged just under five catches and 60 yards receiving last season in 12 games. Um, he had at least four catches and hit the over nine of 12 games. And that was with Cam Newton behind center. Um, might I remind you that Cam Newton averaged only 177 passing yards per game. That was the lowest per game average of, I believe, any quarterback who played enough games to qualify. Um, I personally expect Mac Jones to be a significant upgrade as a passer. Um, New England just doesn't have a lot of talent or depth at wide receiver. Uh, we mentioned that Nelson Aguilar is banged up, didn't practice yesterday, might not play. Kendrick Bourne's there, but behind that, they just don't have a lot of experience. Um, another thing I just love is historically how productive New England slot receivers are. For instance, going back to like Wes Welker, Julian Edelman, and now Jacoby Myers. Um, yeah, the Dolphins are a very good defense with excellent corners. But again, last year they did struggle with opposing slot receivers. I just think this is probably the last time we might see Jacoby's catches as low as three and a half. I think he's one of the most underrated receivers in the NFL. Love it. Your stuff is next level. I don't even know what to say, to be honest with you. Uh, we're really, really close. Part of the reason we struggle sometimes to get to the 100 like button is because uh, so many of you, we've grown such a big audience. You're like, I've already got a sports line description, but there's a lot of people that have it. So hit that like button so I can give away a year long sub to sports line so everybody can become a you know, part of the family. We want everybody to join here. All right. As we wrap up our first NFL prop spectacular, I want to go around the horn. 
And Alex, reemphasize, we'll start with you and just piggyback, seeing they, Dave uh, finish it off for us. Your favorite prop of the week. Alex, you go. Yeah, so my favorite is Raheem Mostert under 17 and a half carries. Um, we mentioned in 48 career regular season games, he's been held under this 47 times. Um, week one against the Lions, I just do not think they're going to need him to get 18 carries. We've also got Trey uh, Sermon in the fold. I want to also mention I love Dave's sprinkle of two touchdowns on Trey Sermon. I think that's definitely worth a little bit of a little bit of coin. So yeah, my favorite is Raheem Mostert under 17 and a half carries. So yeah, go ahead. The Steelers are, are going to be throwing honestly more than they want to. I know they want to establish Najee Harris, but they're going to, in this particular matchup, they're going to have to throw the ball a lot. And, and therefore this is a juju bet for me. I think that's my favorite one. It looks like we might have some general consensus, particularly from Dave on that one. So over 53 and a half receiving yards for Juju Smith-Schuster. Man, I love both of those. And I'm not going to say Juju is my favorite prop too because it's minus 140 and you can just lay less with Sia's. So I'll go with the one that I've seen with my own eyes already, and that's Mike Davis getting over 14 and a half receiving yards at minus 130. I think he's going to have a role in this pass game. I'm not expecting him to be 40 or 50 yards or anything like that, but as long as he gets you 18 receiving yards, you're good to go. Minus 130, it's a lot of juice. But as they say around here, the juice is worth uh, the something. The squeeze. The squeeze. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. It's the squeeze. Oh, okay. Uh, quick last one. Damian Harris scoring a touchdown. Yes or no, Alex? Yes. Love Damian Harris. Yes. That's, a, yes. that's a yes for me. All right, Dave. I don't know what the juice is, so I'm going to say no until I know what the juice is. Oh, God, look at you. It always has to be about the juice with everybody. Does it really matter? Yes, it really matters. All right. Cool. All right, we're up against it. Grab your paper, grab your pencil. Here is the recap. And my goodness, that is glorious. Let's start with Dave. We have a little Mike Davis over. The new under. It's the new longest reception under. Juju over. Uh, Sermon touchdown. And Alex put his stamp of approval on that one. And then uh, Fitzy Magic. Under 37 and a half passing attempts. Then Alex, prop stars on Twitter. Boyd over four and a half receptions. Mostert under. Rogers under. Myers over. Gage under. Sia. Cousins over. Jones under. McCaffrey over. Juju over. And then a couple of long shots, but boy, they're tasty. Vikings to be the highest scoring team of the week or the Cardinals to be the highest scoring team of the week. That's a plus 1,400 and plus eight. We will be here every single Friday afternoon during the NFL season. Nobody works harder. Nobody has better information. And nobody, I promise you, has more fun than me and my team. So we only have one thing left to do. And you know what time it is. Oh, sometimes I throw out a shoulder. Here we go. You've got your marching orders. Let's take all of these prop tickets straight. To the pay window for Prop Stars, for Sia, for Dave, and for the jeweler who puts it all together here at the brand. I am the coach. Let's go get it. Don't forget, count them three separate shows on Sunday morning, noon Eastern, 7 Eastern. We've got you locked and loaded, all things NFL, and also a little supersized morning show on Saturday with AB on the ones and the twos. Until then. Oh, we had some fun today. We are locked. We are loaded. We are focused. And again, this is the Early Edge. Good luck. Do you want best bets in your feed every single day? All you have to do is hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with all things Early Edge.